joining us, I have author Marika Naikov here to talk about the very first novel set in the world, prose novel, set in the world of Critical Role, <laughs> Vox Machina, Kith and Kin. Uh, I, it is almost here. It is coming out on the 30th. It is utterly gorgeous. I'm so stunning. Follow through on my promise. <laughs> Keep so showing enough. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but it's a very good looking book. Uh, and it's also a really, really interesting book and one that's really fun from the perspective of all of us here at D&D Beyond. Obviously, we know our games, we love our games, but fewer of us have tried our hands at prose. Uh, what advice would you give to folks who might want to try to adapt their own game worlds into fiction? Oh, wow. I mean, if you do that, you'd be following in a long line of footsteps of people who have who have done that so great acclaim um, and it's fun so I would recommend trying for sure I think my biggest piece of advice would be to not make it too big especially if you're writing uh, if you're if you're playing a campaign that's been going on for for years and you have like pages full of world building and and NPCs and encounters and and like history between PCs and and the rest of the world, it can be really um, easy to sort of want to try all of it and fall in that trap of, of doing everything and and doing too much. And I imagine that probably gets pretty intimidating pretty fast. And that's perfectly understandable because it would get intimidating for me. And I do this thing professionally, so um, I would suggest picking like maybe an event or like a specific encounter this this like short story type narrative that you can work on and that you can sort of play with and get a sense of figuring out if this if you enjoy writing fiction because it's not for everyone and that's perfectly okay um and and if you do you like having a shorter form gives you more freedom to try things and and maybe like try one story first day and then try something else next um but find something that that you get really excited about that you want to tell and that feels like it has like a beginning a middle and an end in such a way that you can get to the end as well um and maybe go from there and, and look, just see how it goes and don't be don't be alarmed if uh it, it doesn't work out the first time try it again um, don't be alarmed if you fall in love with writing and never look back. That happens to the best of us. Um, <laughs> but just uh, just see what happens. And it's like, I love it. I love writing stories for my campaigns just to get a sense of like, even a sense of like, like history of a certain like deity or um, background to a certain NPC. It can be a really fun way to, to get deeper into your campaign world. Um, but it's it's fun to try. So. Take something that, that feels manageable and go from there. I love that. So what about the opposite direction? Uh, would you have any advice for folks who are inspired by your own novels or other kinds of fantasy works to want to bring elements of that uh, storytelling to bear in their games? As long as I have a, a, a actual writer here, I want to tap the brain. <laughs> I I think probably the opposite opposite piece of advice is let go of your expectations um and and like especially for writers it can feel it, it it's very easy to just want to control everything and want to have a say in everything that's happening and that is absolutely not a thing that you can do in any sort of rpg um whether you're playing or whether you're dming um if you're dming your players will inevitably do something completely different than, than what you were expecting um, so that's that's a good like lesson in in letting go of control. Um, but when you're playing too, you want to make sure that you're not just like taking, claiming all of the narrative and and leaving space for other people and sort of finding that way to um, storytell collaboratively, as opposed to just like having the rest of them feature as a, sort of secondary characters in your your narrative, um, because that wouldn't be fun for anyone. So. In, instead of like claiming that sense of this is what the story needs to be, try to let go of that as, as quickly as you can and 
let yourself be surprised by what other people are doing and, and let yourself be maybe challenged too by what they're doing and, and just enjoy how the story develops without like there's there's always times when as a character you you can see certain things and you can you know where you can push buttons um for better or for worse but well that's that's fun and you definitely should and especially if those are buttons for worse um you want to make sure that you're recognizing the flow of the story and and just going with it as opposed to wanting to cling to all of it hmm. That's great advice. Uh, and I would argue that if people are looking for examples of doing that well, uh, I know, uh, once again, you can watch some amazing performers making choices <laughs> that put each other in fun directions. Um, mm -hmm. I know. I, I, look, I'm just having a really good time. There's a novel out, uh, or about to be out, I from know. Critical Role, which is a game we all watched happen with a beautiful world, and it's just... A really fun feeling to celebrate. So thank you for I, letting yep. me just bask in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that feeling. I've been, I've been like, that's been in the back of my mind for about a year and change ever since I started working on this. So it's just been like, oh my God, this is a thing that's happening. And the closer we get to the book being on the shelves, the more I'm just like, I'm so excited to see what people think of it. Like terrified, but also so excited. I think you're going to have a good time uh, hearing from folks because the book is great. Uh, but, okay, your book does join, you alluded to this earlier, actually, a tradition of novels set in and inspired by RPG worlds. Uh, do you have any favorite works from that tradition? I, um, so once I started reading fantasy, I think one of the, one of the series I fell in love with as like, a young teen or feist books magician and and like all the Crondor books and the Crondor books based on video games based on rpg worlds and like all of them so i'll have to say those because i still occasionally go back to them and just like as a comfort reads like pick up magician again or any of the other i don't know how many books there are in that series i'm genuinely impressed by people who can write more than several books in a series because I think they're like 20 something maybe more I would Incredible. not be able to hold that much world in my head but I love I love those books as a reader like as a teen reader and I still love going back to them so those those would have to be my pick I love that that's Raymond Feist right yeah I gotta yeah. I haven't read those yet they, they sound amazing I've heard oh, yeah. many good things they're so mm -hmm. fun they're so fun. They're just like very traditional fantasy in, in all the good ways and all the, the, the slightly worse ways too. Uh, but they're just like, they're, they're comfort reads. That's the best way to describe them. Aww. So what would you like to see uh, from stories in this tradition or going into the future as we watch media blend into each other over time? Oh God, so much. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know if there's anything specific I want to see, but one of the things I'd love to see is is just I'd love for stories to get. I'd, I'd love to see stories from from all kinds of different traditions and and different types of like game narratives and and ideally to like writers with marginalized backgrounds. I'd love to see more of uh, marginalized writers in. Um, geek media in general but specifically too in in rpg media so um yeah i don't know i uh, just uh, just give me more I'd, I'd love to read it all i this is this is it's such a, this was such a joy for me to write this book but it's also such a, a tradition that i appreciate so much as as a reader and as like a consumer of media so just just give me all of it please now <laughs> I love that. Now, we talked a little bit more about your history with TTRPGs when you visited us this summer for uh, the wonderful show on neurodiversity and as yeah. it relates to TTRPGs. Uh, but for those who might not have missed it, uh, what made you fall in love with TTRPGs? Oh, definitely the, the, the shared storytelling. Um, I like. I started playing, I don't know how old I was. I started playing Dungeons and Dragons 
probably when I was about 15. Um, and around about that same time, I also started playing like online text-based RPGs, including making a ridiculously convoluted like homebrew system for a text-based RPG where I had like people playing in different sides of the same world and I was sort of trying to figure it all out. Um, I mean, I was like 15. I had nothing better to do. <laughs> it was so The ambitions fun. of but, a, a mid-teens yeah. creators are just boundless yeah. in the most beautiful way. Like, hey, it could, yeah, it could work. <laughs> yeah, no, no. That that made no sense in hindsight, but it was we had so much fun. Like I had so many people play in different points of the same world, uh, different parts of the same world, and I had so many so many convoluted rules that sort of like drew from D and D inspiration and other text based stuff. And like I had my definitely had my own homebrew system. Um, but yeah, no, I I I love that sense of shared storytelling and and seeing like the sort of magic uh, that good table can create um, whether it's it's in in just like the story itself or like twists and turns that you never saw coming but that makes so much sense when you know the characters and sort of elevating all the individual stories to forming this this better whole and that's it's it it's such a joy and it's such a good feeling to to be at a table like that and you can feel everything just slotting into place and it it like you can play with people and and even though you've only known them like for a couple of days it can feel like you've played forever you've played together forever and there's there's something that's that's truly amazing about that and I have like I've I've had adventures at tables that definitely still feel like real adventures so yeah that's uh, I don't think anything can compare to that and that's something that I love so so much about about RPGs in general and specifically too about D&D it's so beautiful I love these games so much <laughs> yes do you think that Best you feeling. have do you think that you have drawn skills from those experiences that specifically made you a better writer? Um, or two different. Totally I mean, different things. No, not so much. I think I, I think I've mostly drawn skills from those experiences that made me like better at communicating in general, just in terms of like connecting with people and and improvising and like uh, being able to keep like. A story going when you're not entirely sure what happens next and that like doesn't have to be specifically a story or a book but that can be a, like a super helpful skill in real life too so um i think that's that's primarily how it changed me and and obviously that that bleeds through in in, in fiction too like there's there's no way that like me as a person and me as a writer are not two separate entities um so yeah, like uh, imp uh, improvising is something that's super helpful in fiction occasionally too, when your main characters just refuse to do what you want. Um, and and yeah, <laughs> which I mean, is is it happens, even though I'm not always entirely sure how, but it happens. Um, <laughs> yeah. So no, I th I think primarily like that, and then obviously just like engaging storytelling is so necessary for a, a, a good table and so necessary for a good book too. Um, those two aren't too, too dissimilar at all. Are there any sort of core principles that you've seen maybe folks who are newer to storytelling uh, stumble on when it comes to engaging storytelling or like things that are kind of reliable to fall back on as guidelines if you're trying to push yourself in that direction? Um, oh, wow. Uh... I think specifically when it comes to engaging storytelling in an RPG se uh, setting, what I no that definitely that that holds true for books too actually um, is people who come into come to a table or come into a story with a very set idea of what it needs to be. Um, without like a good understanding of what the shape of a story is so it, it 
can be like a very rigid idea of this is like this is what the character needs to do this is where the story needs to go without like having that sense of okay but this is what is what's happening around that character or this is what's happening to my player but, but also to other players at the table um and i think that that rigid thinking can be tricky <laughs> at the very least can, can it, it can definitely keep you from finding the right story so mm. to those to those players and to those to those writers too i i just suggest like maybe occasionally it's good to take a step back and, and consider if you're still like if the shape of the story still makes sense to you and if you're aware of what it should be um and that may not work for everyone but it definitely works for me i love having a sense of okay this is this gets too convoluted or this gets too detailed or this gets um, maybe too far away from like the main journey of a character or of a uh, player. Um, so I'll just take a step back and look at the, like the broader scale of, of things, the wide scale of things. And yeah, that, that helps, that helps me lose myself in the story without like losing the story to what I want it to be. I love that. I think that's a, a wonderfully clarifying line that you've drawn because I, we've often talked here about sort of the importance of, of being flexible with some of your ideas when you're sitting at a table, but I don't think I had ever thought to connect that to the quality of being engaging because in some ways it seems paradoxical. You feel like I want to come in with a strong idea. That's what will make this compelling. Um, but and and there's you know some truth in that obviously and having some yeah. a strong idea for something but the ability to let that flow and change and be affected by the world and the people around it specifically creates that quality that lets other people hook into it which i think is maybe a, a yeah. part of it i haven't heard somebody put so so well Absolutely. before uh thank you um uh, oh, Radio 407 has another great question. Uh, what authors inspired you to write as a teen? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, primarily Dutch authors. So that's not going to be helpful to most people. Uh, I There is actually, uh, there was one book that I read as a teen that is has since been translated to English fairly recently. Like it came out in the 60s in, in the Netherlands. Um, and it was translated into English like, maybe five years ago um but it's called the letter for the king and it's about this young boy who is a squire and is about to like be the, he'll be nice this next day if he just sits his vigil and, and doesn't let anyone disturb him obviously gets disturbed and goes on this this wild adventure to deliver a letter to a neighboring kingdom and it's it's a very like almost traditional type of like knight like knighthood tale um adventure story that I loved it when I was maybe about nine ten when I read it um and it was like it was the book that I finished reading it and I immediately flipped it over and started reading it again and once I was done I was like I need to figure out how to um become a knight and how to become a writer like those were the two elements that I took away from that book I was like I want to be able to do this too and also I want to be able to fight with swords um from my knowledge you're at least halfway there i don't you could be all the way by now i'm not sure i uh, my my sword fighting is like not great i i own a lot of swords i i feel like that counts for something um, absolutely i tend to be better at archery so it's been fun to ride various archers over the last couple of months um <laughs> I oh, wait, I, this entire stream i didn't put knife. together that like the, yes the, of course kate oh, and no, yeah well, mm -hmm. Now I need yes, the story I've of them been hanging out. Archers. <laughs> oh my god, I would be so into that. I would be super into that. Huh. Just bargain hunting How across LA. That, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yes, archery contest. Mm -hmm. We need that to happen. Um, <laughs> oh, gee, I don't know goodness. what I was saying before this, but uh yes that that absolutely needs to happen um uh, but also oh, you were saying that, you, you're not a knight it, yet yes, but yes. you own a lot of swords I'm, and you're I'm, fairly good at archery so yes. i feel like you're getting a, yes. the well-rounded adventurer package yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like I should still find like a, a like a king or a queen who is willing to like toss me a knighthood, but I haven't really succeeded at that part yet. So, um, <laughs> I mean, if anyone has any leads, definitely hit me up. <laughs> if you are a monarch and you are yeah. watching this stream, yes, just consider it. Yes. Is all we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, but that that book. Uh, just it, it made me want to be a writer it made me want to like be able to draw a reader into a story like that and um the first the first book i ever wrote was basically a sort of fan fiction type thing for that book i also wasn't like i as a, as a 10 year old i was sure it was a book and looking back now it was like 20 pages but it hey. felt like a book at the time <laughs> you got a um, yeah, scale so, there yeah exactly uh, so definitely that book written by Tom Gedracht, which um, good luck trying to find that. Um, but Letter for the King should help. Um, I think so. I'm trying to think of any other any other books. Like I like I said, there were a lot a, a lot of Dutch books that I loved. Um, a lot of really weird books in hindsight too. Like a utopian trilogy is like about a Greenland where all the women were leaders and men just had to do what they said. And then that was a teen book. Um, Go on. It's like, yeah, no, I know. It's like climate disaster utopian story. Like in hindsight, it was super prescient for something that was written in like the 80s. Um, but yeah. That, I, like Dutch books are are weird, but in a great way. Um, none of those now have been translated. Forgive me actually. if this is a silly question, but you mentioned that you you landed on Tolkien fairly early, uh, and I want to say we're yeah. slightly more advanced than me because I did the Hobbit books in junior high. I was not ready for. I was like, the Hobbit is perfect. That's my level. <laughs> we're staying here for a while um, before I got to the rest of them. See, I didn't. Uh, I didn't read the, the Hobbit until much later. Weirdly enough, <laughs> it did take me a while to get through a lot of. Well, it, it took me a while to get through the first hundred pages of Lord of the Rings, and once I got through those, like the rest was fine. But it was just like. <laughs> 100 pages of party descriptions that felt pretty intimidating to me as like a 10 11 year old i i i believe and my, my shameful secret is i read the hobbit and then i went straight through to fellowship got all the way to i think the beginning of two towers and i was like not enough hobbits i don't know why that was just my i was just like i came into this specifically for a purpose <laughs> and uh it was years before i like actually went back and finished them that's my it, my i mean to shame. be fair that is a valid point <laughs> I just, you know, kids have strong opinions about what we're looking for in books. Yeah. Um, uh, Will and Amor, <laughs> question, did you start writing your own characters or did you play in someone else's world first? Which you maybe have already answered for us a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I played in, in someone else's world first, but that didn't take very long. And, and, and that happened to it, like, those were like original characters set in someone else's world. Um, and then I... I went quite quickly quickly from that to writing original characters and, and world building and writing super elaborate and ridiculously cliched fantasy stories um, with like elves and prophecies and everything that your typical fantasy story should have. Um, and then I, I just sort of developed from there and tried different things and I wrote notes, like lots and lots of short stories uh, for a while and basically stumbled into writing contemporary YA fiction first, which I never expected would happen. Um, and from there, just kept broadening my perspective and like, again, went back to short stories and got to, got the chance to do graphic novels and comics and then got back to my, my original love, which is fantasy. I, I'm sort of curious, I guess you, you, you've never necessarily grown up with someone else's brain but so i'm not sure if you can answer this but would you say that like <laughs> sorry yeah this will make sense in a moment um but i love that you mentioned like being strongly influenced by tolkien obviously but also dutch authors do you think that reading in literally multiple languages has shaped your relationship with prose or with fiction in a way that would be useful or that like i mean you you work in different mediums and different styles of story already is that multiplied by being bilingual 
this might be a terrible question. So. This is a very yeah. American question. I mean, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> How do yeah? Um, no, I, I definitely think so, and and I think a, a big part of that too is is not even necessarily like writing coming to writing from a, a different writing tradition, but like the Netherlands isn't particularly big. We had translated fiction. We have a lot of translated fiction. So what I grew up reading from like a very early age was was books translated from English, but books translated from Danish and Swedish and lots of books translated from German. Um, and like the, the comic books that specifically specifically came from uh, Belgium and France, which like European comic books is a fun discussion to have too, because those are so ridiculously different from American superhero comics. Um, so my my introduction to comic books was nothing at all like probably most American comic readers would imagine, um, and and I mean that like th th that isn't necessarily better or worse or anything like that, but it does mean that it it sort of sort of forces you to think about different storytelling traditions and different like ways to. Uh, write and approach characters or plots or um, even even just like the shape of a story uh, like different act structures and things like that and it, obviously it helps that I've always been super interested in just how storytelling functions in general and I've been super interested in how language functions and how language functions in like a broader cultural context that's that was basically me at college for like six years um, but that that I think it's it if nothing else, I think it's it's really healthy to read different types of traditions and 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 read translated fiction if you can get your hands on it. And I think that that may be one of the um, one of the things that I do occasionally. Like there are books that get translated into English, but occasionally it's 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 sad to think that it's mostly the other way around. And there are a lot of books out there that won't ever make like the leap to English, which is still like one of the biggest markets in terms of in terms of books. Um, but like, obviously, as a reader, you can do something about that, which is like demand those stories and, and see if you can find them and make it clear to publishers that there's definitely a market for them and that people are reading it. So if that's something you're interested in, please do, because there are so many amazing books in the world that I will never get to read either because they're not translated into any, any of the languages I speak. And that's a harrowing thought. Um, it does break the heart. Yeah, you no, discover it, a writer and you're like, I love this poem. And they're like, and they wrote seven novels. And unless you can very yes. quickly learn Portuguese, good luck. You know. <laughs> yep. It's, it's, I mean, on the one hand, I, I love the idea that there are so many cool things happening in fiction and in storytelling like simultaneously across the world. And I hate the idea that you'll never get to see all of it. Um, I'm just like, give me all the stories. I just want to, I want to read them all. I want to see them all. I want to understand how they work um, and, and find ways to find the ones that work for me. But yeah, no, it, it's it's helpful. And it's it's good to be open to how different types of storytelling traditions function and how, stories can have different shapes and uh, like even even just something as simple as like we're all super used to three act structured stories like beginning middle end um but that's a super western way of looking at stories looking at storytelling so it's it's fun and and educational and like broadens your perspective and broadens your mind to consume different types of stories as well I love that. And I think it's great advice also for those of us who love the world of games that like focusing in on even like one world setting inside the games, we can be missing, yeah. you know, I, I, for D&D folks, I, I remember when uh, we all first heard about Eberron and we were like, ah, robots? I, hmm, I don't. And, and it was just like, oh, it's this beautiful. <laughs> it adds things that you might not have thought of. This is 20 year old reactions now. But like, uh, there are these beautiful expansions of the imagination then imagination will always lead to more imagination and i love that about yeah, that absolutely do you have uh, speaking of storytelling traditions i'm i'm 
just curious, a, a relatively new one is the world of actual play, of sharing the games that we play. And I mean, historically new, not like mm -hmm. got invented yesterday. But like, um, do you have any specific memory? Do you, do you remember when you got introduced to the concept, whether it was CR or somewhere else? Do you have any memory of like your first reactions to it or what? I think it was probably CR. Um, may have like come across things like that. I think for me, CR hit at a really good time too, because I was sort of struggling with a book I was writing and things were happening in, in, like, in life that I was struggling with. Um, and it felt like such a, such a great escape to sort of just consume someone else's storytelling and find this, this whole wide world to get lost in. Um, and I think I, I, I may have seen like bits and pieces of other types of, of, um, of gameplay before, but none of those like hit at the exact right moment, or they were at times when I was just like completely lost in the book. And, and when that happens, there there's fairly little time for anything else. Um, so yeah, no, that this this came across like I came across CR early on, and um, like I said, it was just it was perfect moment. It was the, it was perfect for me, and basically didn't look back. And obviously found way more streams from there, and um, still have to still trying to figure out how I can fit more than twenty four hours in a day, or maybe have like a few extra days in the week. That would be super helpful too, uh, because I can't actually. Tell us. I, oh God, please! It'd be so great. Um, but yeah, I can't actually like listen to or watch a stream and write a book at the same time. Like I can do music and writing or even it's like having having old episodes of star trek on and writing that's perfectly okay but like consuming extreme media that's new and also creating something that's new that sort of like my brain doesn't stretch that far which is probably good um so yeah a few extra extra hours days would be <laughs> great well, uh, please let us know if you do figure that out. Uh, I'm going to throw in here, <laughs> please feel free to dodge this. Uh, we have a troublemaking question labeled as such from KB Tibbs. <laughs> you seem to have an opinion uh -oh. on which Hawkeye is best Hawkeye. So which twin is best twin? How dare you? <laughs> that Correct. is, how dare you? <laughs> I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> I think that is the only correct answer to the question, because, of course, if you were to choose a favorite, the other one, uh, the, the one you chose would never stop resenting you for not understanding how great the other yes. one is. So you just can't, exactly. you can't win on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, I am. Um, I refuse to like pick a favorite, but like best Hawkeye, that's easy. Obviously, Kate. <laughs> Kate is best Kate. Uh, if folks are interested, of course, I'm just apropos of nothing, but Hawkeye and Kate Bishop is going to be in stores really soon, and you should absolutely <laughs> check it out. Um, but also, mm -hmm. in about a week, you can grab Vox Machina, Kith and Kin, the first prose novel from the world of Critical Role, written by Marika Nikon. Uh, What do you hope people take away from this book? Um... Well, that the twins are awesome, obviously. Um, and I hope it all... I think, I hope it'll, it'll challenge people to think about what home means to them a bit more. No pressure, just, you know, philosophical questions. I love that. And I know that spending any time with the twins always reminds me of how uh, important it is to fight for the people you love. Uh, and I think that you are going to get a, you, the general, you are going to get a lot of that in this book. I think you're <laughs> going to really love it. Thank you so much for giving us so much of your time to come and talk to us about it. Where can people find you for more of your work and all of the many other things you are up to? Um, mostly on Twitter. Far too often. 
Um, I, my, my handle on Twitter is uh, uh, M-A-R-I-E-K-E-Y-N. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it either. So it's just my first name and my initials. Um, but find me there. Find me on my website, which is marikenijkamp.com. Uh, and, and lately on Instagram, which I really don't understand how it works, but I think it's post pretty pictures. So that counts for something. Um, I will usually update all of my books and comics and short stories and other works there, including all of the things that are going through my mind right now that I'm not able to talk about. But pick up, pick up, pick up this one because I love it a lot and I hope you'll too. And with that, thank you so much. I hope if you are watching this and you celebrate a holiday this week, I hope it is delicious and full of home uh if applicable and people that you love uh and we will see you next time on D D beyond it's D &D.